Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And tonight, we have a very interesting topic. Uh, might be a little bit um, uncomfortable for some people, especially the part two. So tonight is a part one and a part two video, of which the second half I've already recorded. And that is up on the website for website members. And that one is actually going to focus more so on some of the research that we're going to be mentioning today regarding the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that has to do with uh, 
putting brain electrodes into various sections of the brain by doctors such as Jose Delgado, uh, Dr. William Sweet. And if anybody's watched the documentary of Truth Stream Media by Aaron and Melissa, it's called The Minds of Men. It's a fabulous uh, over three and a half hour documentary. It took them three years to put together. And I was re-watching that for some of my research on tr transhumanism. And they cover a lot of the MK Ultra projects, of which we'll be focusing on MK Ultra subprojects 94 and 119, which had to do with sort of mapping the brain of humans with the hopes that they would be able to remotely control them and the point of tonight's stream is to show that, in fact, that research was successful. And so we're going to be giving a little bit of a historical overview in this part one. And then we're going to be moving into a lot of conversation concerning Elon Musk and his company Neuralink, of which they are basically picking up where they left off. So we're going to be discussing, again, um, the mapping of the brain. We'll be looking at... a something that's mentioned before, but it's called cybernetics. And cybernetics is a sort of theory of information that has to, it concerns itself with feedback loops and feedback loops of information regarding machine and humans or machine and animals and how there is a sort of informational feedback loop and how that can be manipulated and how in fact organisms can be manipulated through that cybernetic process. So we're going to be discussing that. We'll be looking at some of the medical implications, or at least some of the medical rhetoric, because that is going to be a thing that coincides with both the research that we'll be covering, especially in the 1950s and 60s, where various rogue doctors, although the U.S. government was in full support of people basically putting electrodes in people's brains, began with people that were mentally ill, but it quickly moved into placing electrodes in people's brains who they deemed to be violent, whether they were actually violent or not, and seeing what exactly would happen, some of which included um, O.J. Andy, Dr. O.J. Andy down in New Orleans. He, in fact, um, did research on children, and he was putting electrodes into children, uh, young children. I mean, there's one instance of a nine-year-old boy and they would use these electrodes and just to see what happened, Do Dr. Peter Bregan even mentioned that they would heat them up so hot by activating the electrode that it would burn holes into the heads of these children. And so maybe Neuralink isn't going to that extreme. We'll discuss. We'll talk about it. But uh, it could be, again, like I said, uh, maybe some people might get a bit queasy, specifically in part two. And so, like I said, part two is a two hour and 20 minute video that I recorded earlier today. It's already up on the website. So if you want to see the second half of this stream, please, please support my work. Go to my website, become a member. It's $5 a month. I would greatly appreciate it. It helps my work. And I promise you, we got tons of great content coming in the future. I want to give a very special shout out. Melly just gifted five Codal Crew memberships. Thank you so much, Melly, for that support. Uh, thank you very, very much. So. I hope everybody, uh, is, yeah, five memberships. Woo, thank you, says Dr. Crispy. I hope everybody's grabbing up those memberships. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we're going to be covering quite a bit of stuff. Um, where we begin, um, I want to talk about what, kind of what prompted the research that led to um, today's topic. So it began with realizing, and, and we're going to look at a historical overview. And here, let me just bring that up real quick so we can see a little bit of what I'll be discussing. Um, and so like this right here, the history of brain machine implants, we can see that back in 1780 here, uh, Luigi Galvani discovers that muscles of dead frogs can be stimulated using an electrical spark. And this is a picture of him uh, taking a dead frog that's already been dissected and, in fact, uh, placing an electric stimulus to it and seeing that the muscles actually contract. And this is huge for this research because it began to understand that there is a sort of electrical system in regard to the central nervous system and how the human body functions, but the body is of, of really all organisms. We move down our timeline here. We see that in 1870... Edward Hitzig and Gustav Fritsch 
cause muscle movements through the electrical stimulation of specific parts of a dog brain. And so this is the first time where they begin to add electrical stimulus to the brain of which they did with a dog. But we, as you can imagine, within 100 years, um, this is going to be done inside of humans. 1874, Robert Bartholomew experiments with electrical stimulation in the brain of a woman with a hole in her head. And then where I'm going to be really be picking up is right here in 1952. Dr. Jose Delgado demonstrates the ability to control behavior using implanted electrodes by stopping a charging bull. Now, this is huge because as the second half of the title implicates uh, implants and remote control of the body. We'll get into a little bit of who Jose Delgado was, but he certainly wasn't a friend. He was a actually a political philosopher as well as a neurosurgeon. And so he actually had some thoughts that we probably would not uh, be supportive of in regards to a rejection of the concept of the individual or any sort of primacy of the individual. He actually believed that the United States was built on a faulty premise because he believed based on this research that got going in regards to cybernetics that there are too many societal influences on individuals to actually be autonomous and truly have free will. And therefore, he believed that the only thing that has rights is society as a whole. And I want to highlight here that I'm again, if anybody wants to be very generous this Christmas season and help me out, I would love for somebody to help me purchase this book right here, Physical Control of the Mind Toward a psycho civilized society this is a book from 1970 actually documenting by dr jose delgado his uh research and so it's toward a psycho civilized society he believed that through the implantation of various electrodes that we could then become more civilized this is going to relate to some research regarding uh, race riots in the 1960s, of which many of these doctors used that as a impetus to experiment with people that were violent and how they could inhibit violence because it was a threat to our liberal democracy. And so um, this is a bit of an expensive book. It's a very important book. I really want to use it for my research. And that is an 80 dollar paperback book that uh if you would be so generous tonight maybe you guys can help me uh get enough funds i would love to purchase this book and let me just tell you a little bit about what it's about so physical control of the mind and manipulation of the brain is a novel event in human history in this volume dr jose mr delgado describes his pioneering work in implanting electrodes in the brains of cats monkeys and men as we'll see a bowl in particular that was part of uh, this presentation, this little PowerPoint here. This is where he was able to demonstrate by putting electrodes in a bowl, the bowl he could get to charge. So he had a matador inside the ring. This occurred in Spain, although most of his research occurred in the United States. And the bowl would charge, as you would expect, with the big red cape and the matador. But then he would step in the ring. The matador would leave. He would get a red cape, as he has in this photo. And he would stimulate the bull's brain and it would stop in its tracks and run away from him, demonstrating that he could control physical behavior of animals despite their normal biological tendencies. And so this book, that's what that's where his research is in. So through electrical stimulation of specific cerebral structures, Delgado demonstrates how movements can be induced by radio command. Hostility may appear or disappear. Social hierarchy can be modified. Sexual hate behavior may be changed and memory, emotions and the thinking process may be influenced by remote control. The mind is no longer unreachable and may be the subject of experimental investigations. According to Delgado, we need to reorient the aims of civilization to restore a balance between its physical and psychological evolution. Our present mechanized society is dangerously self-perpetuating and should be psycho civilized in order to develop wiser minds to intelligently control our awesome technological advances. Dr. Delgado believes mankind's primary objective should not should be, quote, not the development of machines, but of man himself. He writes lucidly about this work. 
putting it into the context of what is known about the mind and the brain and exploring long range ethical and social implications for his discoveries. Despite the ongoing controversy over his work, the result is an exceedingly important and provocative book. Jose Delgado was born in Ronda, Spain, and received his medical training at Madrid University, where he was an associate professor of physiology until 1950, when he came to Yale University to work with Dr. John Fulton. He became a professor of physiology at Yale, where he developed techniques for electrical and chemical stimulation of the brain. He published more than 200 scientific papers and became perhaps the most notorious mind control researcher in the history of neurobehavioral research. So this is actually quite an important book. Uh, if you guys would be uh, appreciative of what we're trying to do, I would love for you guys to help me out and try to raise enough funds tonight that I might be able to purchase this book and do a presentation here for you guys on it, providing an overview. Oh, thank you so much. We got a super chat that came in from Anglo Christian throws in $10. And thank you very much for that. And we had another one come in from Beyond Sarah from throws in $20 says Merry Christmas. Let's get you this book. Thank you so much. I really want to get this. And again, I'll read the whole thing and provide a chapter by chapter overview for you guys, because it's fascinating, right? Um, I saw a little bit of the, the content and it's literally documenting every activity that man has participated in uh, politics, religion, relationships, and how his research has given him new insights on how these things can be manipulated. So even though it's an old book, it's from 1970, I think it's monumental in regards to my dissertation research regarding transhumanism because it's a missing link. Um, as we'll see in some of the academic papers, it's interesting that they want to often uh, skip over this part of the research, these the 1950s and 60s. Uh, we'll, I'll show you a few academic papers that point that out. Oh, thank you so much. Melly throws in $10 after donating uh, five Kotal Crew memberships. Thank you so much, Melly. I really appreciate that, guys. Thank you very, very much. Um, such, a, <laughs> yeah, such a loving term, manipulated, really conveys their good intentions. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, Dr. Delgado uh, tend to it appeared to have more of a communistic leaning and was very antagonistic to what he considered the American project because America, he was in opposition to the Declaration of Independence because it was too focused on the individual and individual freedom, which, again, he rejected based on his research and his ability to manipulate people by putting in electrodes and stimulating different parts of their brain. And he said, well, based on this, that, uh, you know, man really isn't truly autonomous and to develop a, a civilization based on the presupposition of individualism, he considered to be a detriment. So this is something that I really want to <laughs> research and get into. But in regards back to our PowerPoint presentation. So even before Dr. Delgado in 1952, in 1924, Hans Berger use an EEG to record the electrical activity of the human brain for the first time. Why is that important? Why is that important? That's very important because as we'll see, the EEGs, and this is the brain waves in which that can be monitored. Now they can put stuff on your scalp to monitor these. Uh, this is also how Neuralink works by putting in these very, very small wires when they put in the electrode of the Neuralink into your brain. Um, it can monitor, again, the electrical activity in your brain. And so what they believed, because they're using cybernetics, this understanding of these informational feedback loops, that, well, really what we need to do is figure out how to communicate directly with the brain. And they believe that EEGs were the first non-symbolic language. First non-symbolic language. And this is going to actually tie to some of the research, uh, very controversial research, of a gentleman named, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. Here it is right here, Norbert Weiner. Norbert Weiner developed the autocorrelator, which was basically a massive computer in the 1950s where he was able to, and I'll show you a photo. Uh, this, is, this is Norbert Weiner Studios. This is him recording brain waves emerging from the autocorrelator. This was a massive machine, the first machine, and this was a breakthrough 
and brain research because they could put these electrodes into the brains of animals and humans. And within initially, there was a 20 minute feedback loop that they could see directly what was happening in the brain, what was being stimulated. And in return, they could then the autocorrelator could send information back to the brain. Now, just within a decade or so, these autocorrelators got more advanced. And by the third generation, they were actually real time. So while somebody was actually moving about doing activities, they could map the EEG, the brain waves of that person. Now, why is this going to be really important for our part one discussion tonight? Because when we start to look at Neuralink, this is exactly what they're doing, except I have videos of Elon Musk specifically stating that the full intentions of Neuralink is a symbiosis of man and machine, particularly advanced artificial intelligence. And so the AI system, much like the autocorrelator here, is going to be feeding info back to your brain, stimulating your brain in certain ways, and potentially even shutting off certain parts of your brain. We just did a stream on extropianism, the central philosophy of transhumanism, and philosopher David per David Peirce of the UK is a utilitarian or a negative utilitarian philosopher who wants to eliminate suffering. Some of you guys might remember he even wants to reprogram carnivorous animals so that they'll no longer eat other animals to eliminate suffering. Now, this brings up huge questions in regards to if you eliminate suffering, if you begin to implant these electrodes and you begin to shut off certain parts of the brain, are you still fully human? Are you still the, the biological entity that, as an Orthodox Christian, we believe God intended us to be and created us to be? These are massive questions that uh, for many of these people, they really don't care to answer because they view your brain as a computer, a biological computer, and therefore this is part and central to their research. So um, getting back here, we can see from after Jose Delgado in 1954, we can get to 1969, the first cochlear implant uh, implanted, restoring the sense of sound and demonstrating the possibilities of neural implants. In 1996, neurotrophic electrodes were implanted in a paralyzed man, enabling him to control a computer cursor. This is some of the things, if you saw the Twitter space that Elon Musk was just in with Alex Jones, Vivek Ramaswamy, all these different people, he was highlighting that Neuralink is now in its human phase trials and that they're implanting the Neuralink in paraplegic people so that they can have full control of their computer screens and the computer. Again, these are um, BMIs or BCIs, these are brain machine interfaces or brain computer interface chips. That's the point of it. And as we see, once we get to the later 90s, where computers are much more developed than they were in the 50s and 60s, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, in 1997, deep brain stimulation, the deep brain project is something that Google did to map the entire structure of the brain. And that deep brain stimulation is approved in the USA as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. In 2005, a man with tetraplegia is able to control a robot arm due to a brain computer interface, BCI, created as part of the BrainGate project. In 2016, or here we go, 2012, BrainGate allows a woman to drink from a bottle by controlling a robotic arm with her thoughts. In 2016, Elon Musk launches Neuralink to develop ultra high bandwidth brain machine interfaces, BMIs. So you see BCI, BMI, these are going to be um, basically interchangeable. And in 2018, three people with paraplegia are able to walk due to wireless spinal implants. So again, this is just a little bit of an introduction of what we're going to be doing tonight. So I want to, again, another super chat major. Thank you to Maximos for the $2.99 Christus Verbiscum. Merry Christmas to all. Thank you very much, Maximus, for that support. I truly appreciate it. Again, you guys are helping me get closer and closer to being able to purchase this book, uh, which is the goal for tonight's stream. I hope to raise enough money for that. So thank you very much, Maximus, for that. And our brother, Dr. Crispy Rothschild, a Koto Crew member for six months, says, I just want to link my brain to my smart fridge to order tofu and kibble. Yeah, well, they would love for you to do that. They really would. 
So uh, I'm sure uh, that that technology is already here and present. So if that's what you want, Dr. Crispy, I'm sure you can have that. All right. So uh, just wanted to let everybody know if you do want to uh, show some support for tonight's stream, the best way is to use the Streamlabs or the Dono chat link. Both of those are in the video description or YouTube if you prefer YouTube. So again, let me do my little monologue here in regards to introducing this topic. We've already covered a little bit here, but this project about brain implants has to do mostly with the realization that electricity is essential to the way that the human body functions and that <clears throat> stimulating different parts of the brain can actually stimulate the body and stimulate various behaviors. So this was the realization, as I said, that electrical stimulation can not only stimulate muscles, but also the brain itself. Under MK Ultra subprojects 94 and 119, these were subprojects that had these specific intentions of putting electrodes in brains for the purpose of seeing how they could remotely control individuals. It began, for example, Jose Delgado's research began with these implants and there'd be huge cords in uh, monkeys, rats, bulls. Um, well, the bull was after it was remote control and even humans. And they would have these huge cords hanging, hanging out of their heads. But once they got into the 60s, they were able to use uh, remote control. And so he was able to sort of create these controls with various buttons and the buttons would highlight which part of the brain would be stimulated and he could turn off and turn on. And so in part two, which is already up on the website, we play basically the second half of the documentary, The Minds of Men, and I talk about aspects of it. And it's very, very eye opening. So um, this leads the theorists, especially at that point in the early 20th century, of seeing the brain as a biocomputer. And the reason they saw this is because the development of the field of cybernetics, cybernetics. So for those of you who aren't familiar here, let me pull this up. Cybernetics is an is applied to complex systems. Cybernetics is associated with models in which monitor compares what is happening to a system at various sampling times with some standard of what could be happening and controller could adjust the system. Okay, cybernetics comes from, uh, it's often referred to as pilot. It comes from the Greek word um, cybernetikos, uh, good at steering or often translated as pilot. But if we go down here, we look at uh, Norbert Weiner. Uh, so the American mathematician Norbert Weiner, and that's why it's so important because he used various forms of like mathematical logic, and that's how he created the autocorrelator is that by creating these various mathematical equations, pro programming them into the computer, he was able to begin to map the EEGs and the actual brain patterns of people. Um, he published his book, Cybernetics, in 1948, and that book, Weiner, made reference to an 1868 article by British physicist James Clerk Maxwell on governors that pointed out the term governor is derived via the Latin from the same Greek word that gives rise to cybernetics. The date of Weiner's publication is generally accepted as the making the birth of cybernetics as an independent science. Weiner defined cybernetics as a science of control and communications in the animal and the machine. Often people think about cybernetics and they think of sort of informational feedback loops concerning machines. But the, in, the initial point of the research was seeing how these informational feedback loops move through humans, move through man, and can be altered and manipulated. Therefore, it makes sense, the informational cybernetic feedback loop of the autocorrelator of our electrified society, uh, you know, stopping at a green light, for example, is an electrical signal the green light that then has an informational feedback loop that we register through our brains and then act accordingly. So this is a minor, minor instance of a sort of cybernetic feedback loop that we then act in accordance with machines, electrical digital technology. This definition relates cybernetics closely with the theory of automatic control and also with physiology, particularly the physiology of the nervous system. For instance, a controller might be the human brain, which might receive signals from a monitor, the eyes, regarding the distance between a reaching hand and the object to be picked up. The information sent by the monitor to the controller is called feedback. And on the basis of this feedback, the controller might issue instructions to bring the observed behavior, the reach of the hand, closer to the desired behavior. 
the picking up of the object. Indeed, some of the earliest work done in cybernetics was the study of control rules by which human action takes place with the goal of constructing artificial limbs that could be tied in with the brain. Of course, we know this is totally possible. I did a stream on cyborgs. They can absolutely tap into your central nervous system at this point along with your brain, and you can have a fully functioning artificial limb, a leg, an arm, and you control it by pure thought. So that's the reason why we got there is again through the research of cybernetics. In subsequent years, the computer and the areas of mathematics related to it, examples, intended examples, uh, mathematical logic had a great influence on the development of cybernetics for the simple reason that computers can be used not only for automatic calculations, but also for all conversions of information including the various types of information processing used in control systems. This enhanced ability of computers has made possible two different views of cybernetics. The narrower view, common in Western countries, defines cybernetics as the science of the control of complex systems of various types, technological, biological, and social. In many Western countries, particular emphasis is given to aspects of cybernetics used in the generation of control systems in technology and in living organisms. A broader view of cybernetics arose in Russia and other Soviet republics and prevailed there for many years. And this broader definition, cybernetics includes not only the science of control, but all forms of information processing as well. And this way, computer science, considered a separate discipline in the West, is included as one of the component parts of cybernetics. So it was through the cybernetic research that various theorists began to look at man as a biological machine. And this divorces the concept of sort of a mind or even free will to a full degree. Some of these people would reject that we have full autonomous free will. But these informational feedback loops began to look at man and his techno environment, shaping him and creating a new being. They believe that the man of the 20th century, and of course now even deeper into the 21st century, is becoming something totally different due to these cybernetic feedback loops and our constant interaction with electronic technology. So uh, they began to theorize that they could program a biological person similar to the way that they program a computer by creating, again, these cybernetic feedback loops. This is where Jose Delgado picks up on the cybernetic research. And cybernetics really gets going, again, as Dr. Norbert Weiner's book was in 1948. Um, so throughout the 30s, the 40s, and then into the 50s, cybernetics was a huge topic of some of the most prominent scientists in the West. And once Stalin died, what was that, in 1952, I believe Stalin dies? In 1953 and forward, we see that there's secret meetings between the most prominent scientists regarding to psychosurgery, neurosurgery, brain implants, cybernetics, and various Soviet scholars as well. So even though we were in a Cold War, I think what we can see is much of the Cold War and the space race during that point was less about actual race into space and more so about a race into the space within your head and understanding how to control that, manipulate that, and eventually by remote control the behavior of people. So Ho Dr. Jose Delgado began to, what he believed, conquering the human mind is a national goal. As I said, Dr. Jose Delgado was not somebody in favor of the concept of individualism. And he believed the only thing that has rights is the collective, the society, and that individuals were expendable. And this comes forward in the research of people like Dr. Vernon Mark, Frank Irvin, who took an individual, again, as I told you, there was these uh, race riots happening in the 1960s. Well, at that time, the media was, was talking about how violence was an epidemic in America and that Americans and America was an overly violent nation and that this needed to be cured. And so Lyndon B. Johnson, the president at the time, commissioned a new uh, study of how to control violence, the psychological factors that contribute to violent behavior. And so under that auspices, these doctors like Dr. Vernon Mark and Frank Irvin, they would take individuals and began to uh, limit their violent behaviors. One individual, his name was Leonard Kyle. Um, there was a famous book that Vernon Mark and uh, Frank Irvin wrote. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Here it is. Um, 
which was a total lie. It was called violence and destruction, violence and the brain. This was, again, you can see here by Vernon H. Mark and Frank R. Irvin, published in 1970, which was actually a total fraud. In that book, they claimed that they had a man named Thomas R., which was a pseudonym. It was actually a gentleman named Leonard Kyle, and he was a prominent engineer. He had U.S. patents for Polaroid. He was working for a variety of major corporations in the United States. And these gentlemen said that he had violent behavior. He had outrages of violence, and he was going to the VA. I guess he had, in actuality, he had minor levels of depression. Turns out he actually wasn't a violent person, but through their ability, they took this man into their research facility at uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital and began to place electrodes into his brain to cure his violence tendencies. Now, according to some of the papers that later came out due to FOIA requests, uh, Leonard Kyle was upset with his wife because he believed that she was having an affair with him. A gentleman was renting a room in their house, and he believed while he was at work, his wife was actually having an affair with this particular gentleman. His wife actually uh, asked. She first sent him to her own psychiatrist, but then recommended him for this type of research because she claimed he was too violent. Turns out he wasn't violent. Uh, there were, again, the, the doctors here, Vernon Mark and Frank Irvin, claimed that he was slamming his pregnant wife into the wall. He had six children, uh, claimed that he was slamming his children, uh, none of which happened. According to Dr. Peter uh, Bregan, the only thing that happened is he threw a canned food at his wife, did not hit her with it, but it smashed against the wall. And that was only the only reported violent act that this man had. However, they basically turned him into a vegetable. They began to experiment. They put over 80 electrodes into his brain. Um, they would He would walk around a psych ward or at the VA hospital or at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and they would manipulate his behavior without him even knowing it uh, because they had this ginormous remote control, and they began to experiment with him. And this pretty much destroyed the man. And it shows you the lack of ethics that was, being, that was taking place during this time. So... My point is that Jose Delgado is not an anomaly when he talks about the conquering of the human mind as a national goal and all individuals are expendable. And so a gentleman really interestingly named Dr. William Sweet was well aware. It turns out that Vernon Mark, this gentleman right here, Dr. William Herbert Sweet, here's a huge, uh, lovely article about him in the Harvard Gazette. Uh, fails to mention the fact that Dr. William Sweet was signing off. He was one of the most well-connected doctors, um, chief neurosurgeon, emeritus of Harvard Medical School, former chief uh, neurological service, Massachusetts General Hospital, and they totally lied. So in this book, Dr. Frank er or uh, Dr. Um, Vernon Marks and Frank Irvin claimed that Thomas R. Leonard Kyle was a major success. They were able to hook all these electrodes into his brain and totally nullified all his violent behavior, was able to release him back into society, and he had no ill effects. It was a total lie. The man was in a psych ward. He was never released, and he only became worse and worse and worse due to their research. And he was basically just a guinea pig. And so much funding coming even from the U.S. Congress. Congress wrote recent research grants to these people based on the idea that this research was limiting violence. And this is one of the worst social epidemics in America because Americans are inherently violent, according to these studies. So even this gentleman right here, Dr. William Sweet, despite this lovely uh, memorial, again, talking about how he was such an ethical person. He had a profound effect on his children. Um, in my eyes, he was a pattern of virtue, said uh, David Sweet, the, the son of Dr. William Sweet. And I don't know about these children. I he, he may have been a wonderful father to them, but he was well aware that these doctors, and him included, were totally lying about the fact that they were this Thomas R. Leonard Kyle was actually not free. He was not a success. And turns out, I think it was over 40 patients that they did this research to, none of which they actually found evidence that they had violent tendencies or behavior before the research began. So going back to Dr. Jose Delgado, um, 
he believed, as I said earlier, that America's founding is scientifically incorrect based on their research on cybernetics, electronic stimulation, these informational feedback loops, that man was not autonomous and that there were too many socio and cybernetic forces for there to be true autonomous individuals. And therefore, society has a right, not the individual, and anything can be done for the betterment of the social good. Um, I want to say that this is all done under the disguise of the, of the medical field, right? So this was always to help people. This was to limit violence. This was to advance man and create him as, again, the book that I hope you guys help me uh, get some funds for tonight, The Physical Control of the Mind Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society by Dr. Jose Delgado. For a psycho-civilized society, this medical research was to civilize man. This is for your own betterment. This is not to harm you. This is because you're harming yourself because you're not up to par. And so this guise of the medical, you can't help but correlate it to things that are being mentioned today. Oh, I didn't even bring this up. This was the book. Again, for those of you who just joined, uh, if, you, if, if you're feeling generous this Christmas season, uh, the point of tonight's stream, I'm trying to raise some funds for this book right here, The Physical Control of the Mind Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society by the gentleman we're discussing, Dr. Jose Delgado. So if you'd like to support, please do using the Streamlabs or Dono Chat link or YouTube. So all this was done under the auspices of medicine and helping patients. And this is exactly what we hear when we look at this part one video, which is going to focus much more on the contemporary issues of Neuralink and Elon Musk research, because even though I have a video on the premiering of the Neuralink technology, during that premiere, during that press conference, uh, Elon Musk says the whole intention of Neuralink is to create a, a symbiosis of man and, art and artificial intelligence. Now, of course, he goes on to Joe Rogan and tells everybody about the ills of artificial intelligence, yet at the same time, his in ex explicit intended purpose of Neuralink is to make sure that your brain can interact directly with an artificial intelligence, of which then it can monitor the EEGs that are going on in your brain, and it can then feed back information, whether to activate, stimulate, or negate various parts of your brain. Of course, this is working. So as Elon Musk talked about in his Twitter space, uh, there are human trials right now with paraplegics, and they're putting in Neuralink uh, devices in the skull, and people who are totally paraplegic can now control their computer with their mind. And so it's not that they can't do this. And Elon Musk talks about how um, they're trying to give uh, hearing to the deaf, that Neuralink is going to allow deaf people to hear. It's going to allow blind people to see. It's going to allow paraplegic people to walk. You can't help but notice the overlaps with some of the work of Christ, of which was done through miracles and God's will as a believer versus the use of these sort of invasive technologies. And who is to say that Neuralink and, you know, apparently as we'll watch the video, Neuralink is going to be an app. So once you get the implant in your head, you'll be able to monitor your own EEGs by looking at your app and you can uh, in some way influence it yourself, monitor it yourself. But who wants to be hooked up to an advanced artificial intelligence that's going to be able to have full access to you? And as we've demonstrated with books like this and provide full physical control of the mind, which leads to full physical control of the body. Sounds like a bit of an inversion, if you ask me. But the point of this science is that it's totally here. It's now. They're able to do this stuff. This isn't science fiction. This is present tense. And... um. Yeah, so Neuralink is described in the exact same medical ways in which the research that I just highlighted of people like Dr. Vernon Mark, Frank Irvin, Jose Delgado, William Sweet, uh, Norbert Weiner, all of them performed their experiments under the auspices of medicine and helping people. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't help people because as we saw, like, uh, cochlear implants were able to be implanted and deaf people were able to hear to some degree due to this research. And that's why it's a sort of double-edged sword, right? Do you, I mean, if you had a relative or a parent or a sibling that was deaf or blind and they have the opportunity to be able to see or hear, you think that'd be a great thing. 
but at what expense and what expense at our society as we're moving to a point in which this all this information can essentially be centrally controlled, especially if it's tied to an artificial intelligence, let alone, you know, people who are familiar with cyber polygon that imagine all these people hooked up to these electronic devices, uh, electrodes in the brain. What happens if, uh, you know, the, the grid goes out, uh, electronics go out, uh, it all begins to backfire. Who knows? So um, I ask, is this really an amplification or a dehumanization? Again, we talked about in the extropian stream, the central philosophy of transhumanism, that one of their central goals is to eliminate suffering. But if is the elimination of suffering to the human man is that really going to make him more human? Is that going to make him better? What about the continual pleasure senses? So like one of the researches that Dr. Jose Delgado did is he put electrodes into a rat and the rat was able to step on a pedal and that pedal would stimulate the pleasure sense of the brain. Well, what happened to the rat? The rat would become so addicted to stepping on the pedal to receive the stimulation to the pleasure sense of his brain that he was willing to forfeit eating, forfeit uh, sexual habits, forfeit um, even the safety of himself. They would place an electric grid. They would electrify it and there'd be a pedal on this side and a pedal on this side. The rat would run across the electric grid of great pain to itself to get onto this side so it could step on the pedal, get its stimulus, and then he'd have to go to the other pedal to get that stimulus again. And he would still run across an electrified grid that would shock him and harm him just to get his pleasure sense. And you think, geez, that sounds a lot like the Kumpod future that many people have theorized about where you get all the pleasure you want, but you'll own nothing and you'll like it. And the fact that this research was already carried out in the 1950s makes it a little bit worrisome because where is the state of this technology in 2023 in the 21st century? As we'll see, the electrodes that Neuralink puts in are so much smaller and yet so much more powerful. And the electrodes themselves are so fine, they're about the same size as a neuron itself. A little bit worrisome. And so is this really about the amplification of man? Is this really about the development and taking man to a new state? Or is this about a limitation? Is this about a dehumanization? And so I have a couple quotes I want to share with you guys. And the first one comes from this book right here. This is written, this is uh, from the 1960s. Um, this is from a gentleman named uh, Jacques Alou. Let me make sure it's from the 60s. It might have been earlier. Um, this is from, yeah, 64, 1964. He, uh, this is a French intellectual who was critical of where technology was taking society. And he wrote a book called The Technological Society. And Jacques Alula writes, this is a quote, the complete joining of man and machine will be calculated according to a strict system, the so-called bioocracy. So biocracy. It will be impossible to escape this system of adaptation because it will be articulated with such scientific understanding of the human being. The individual will have no more need for his own conscience and the utilization of virtue. His moral and mental furnishings will be a matter of the biocrats' decisions. Interesting. Very interesting. And another quote that I have that um, is interesting in regards to maybe some of the spiritual implications of this stuff. This comes from a gentleman which we probably wouldn't support. It actually comes from Rudolf Steiner, one of the uh, perennialist part of the uh, traditionalist school. But he had an interesting quote from the late um, from the early 20th century, late 1800s, late 19th century, and says, in the future, we will eliminate the soul with medicine. Under the pretext of a healthy point of view, there will be a jibby jab, he uses the V word, by which the human body will be treated as soon as possible directly at birth so that the human being cannot develop the thought of existence of a soul or spirit. Two materialistic doctors will be entrusted with the task of removing the soul of humanity. As today, people are vaccinated against this disease or that disease, so in the future, children will be jibby-jabbed with a substance that can produce precisely in such a way that people, thanks to his jibby-jab, will be immune to being subject to the madness of the spiritual life. He will be extremely smart, but he would not develop a conscience 
And that is the goal of some materialistic circles. And so I ask you, is this the case? It certainly seems plausible to some degree. And um, you, and this leads to, again, a, a Pavlovian response. Are we really just Pavlov's dogs? If we ha all have electrodes in our brain and we're able to get our pleasure senses tingled whenever we want, are we truly human? Because this is part of the transhumanist rhetoric is that that's going to free you. It's going to limit you. But from my understanding, that's only going to enslave you. That's going to put you in a box. That's going to limit who you are and your capabilities. I don't see any freedom there at all. And in fact, that correlates with Dr. David Peirce's research in regards to his negative utilitarianism and the elimination of suffering. Eliminating suffering does not make my life better. Suffering is something that's essential for my own growth. Some, suffering is something that was shared by me and the incarnated God. And suffering is something that makes us more human and makes us able to develop and change and, co and course correct. And if you don't have that, just like somebody who doesn't have the ability to feel pain, they can put their hand over a flame and the flame begins to blister their skin. It begins to burn their body, but they can't feel it. Is that truly healthy? Is that truly an advancement or is that a dehumanization? I ask you guys. And so is this really about um, us becoming automatons, right? Because much of this research is built upon the, the idea that you actually don't have free will and that free will, the individual really isn't something to worry too much about. And this sounds like we're becoming more and more like a robot as the symbiosis, as we'll see that Elon Musk uh, is in favor of regarding Neuralink. This sounds more like us becoming like a machine versus a symbiosis with machines. And so I'll leave that there. Smash that like, guys. Uh, I hope it's going to be a fun stream. Thank you all very, very much for being here. Um, all right. Um, if anybody would like to support my work, one of the best things you can do is become a website member. And so you can do so with this link right here. Again, the second half of this stream is already up at the website for all website members. Um, so you can do so with this link right here, the part two, which is two hours and 20 minutes already recorded, already up at the website. It's $5 a month. It's a great way to help me out. I would truly, truly appreciate it. Um, and you, we also have fitness memberships of which I'll be talking tomorrow, um, with, <coughs> um, sorry, my phone just went off. I'll be talking tomorrow with father Moses McPherson about potentially setting up a fitness group for Orthodox Christians to talk about training and fasting during our, our fasting periods. So this is all uh, in the works. Also, if you want to become a Logos Premium member, we just had a members meeting, a private Zoom meeting of, of premium members this past Wednesday, and we'll have another meeting coming on December 27th, December 27th. So if you guys would like to join that, please become a Logos Premium member. Also, if anybody would like to set up a one-on-one -on -one session, we can do so Usually I do those on Wednesdays. You can do so with this link right here. We can talk about any topic you would like to dive into. And also, if anybody would like to sponsor a stream, I'll be finishing up uh, some of the research on one of our sponsored streams, looking at Freemasonry and its role in various revolutions in history. Um, you can sponsor a stream with that link right there. I would greatly appreciate it. And also, don't forget to grab something over at the shop. You can do so on my website or also over on YouTube. If you go over to the YouTube store, we got products over there as well. Be greatly appreciative if anybody wanted to support that. And as I said, here is the, uh, the library there for members. And you can see part two is already up. Like I said, that's two hours and 20 minutes long. And that is a continuation of our conversation tonight. Tonight, part one is really to introduce you to the topic, introduce you to the movers and shakers, so that when you watch part two, you're going to be able to better follow what exactly is going on. So thank you all for that. Also, if anybody is in the market for some Orthodox items, feel free to check out orthodoxdepot.com, orthodoxdepot.com. It's a great Orthodox company here in the Midwest. And you can get 10% off all items by using the promo code CODAL, and you can help me out as well. I would greatly appreciate that. So if you're looking for icons, bracelets, necklaces, um, incense, whatever it may be, go over to orthodoxdepot.com, see if they got something that you're looking for, and use promo code CODAL, and you'll be able to help me out as well. 
All right. So now with that being said, let's get into more of tonight's topic. Again, if anybody would like to help, um, I am trying to raise some funds so that I can purchase uh, this book right here. I saw somebody said they have a digital copy. Yes, I really prefer to use a physical copy when I do research, just a tendency of myself. Um, you can see here's a few books that I'm I got, I'm working on right now. I like physical books. Uh, I prefer in case, again, if the grid goes down, I got my research, I got my books. Um, and right now, uh, it is a $80 paperback book. I just want to get the paperback. Uh, and I would greatly appreciate all donations tonight are going to go for one, my life, two, for purchasing this book. So, if you guys want to help out with some of that research, I promise if I get this book, I'm going to read it and I'll do a stream for you guys, no doubt. Okay, so now let's get into some of the history of this stuff. Like I said, EEGs was, was believed to be the first non-symbolic language, and this is huge for this research. Um, uh, EEG is an electroencephalography. And it is used, it looks just like this, and it's used to monitor brain waves and brain function. <clears throat> oh, somebody said, how much is needed? Uh, the books, it's, I mean, with taxes, it's probably going to be around $85. So around 85 is going to be the price of the book. Um, so again, if anybody wants to contribute to that tonight, I would greatly appreciate that. So thank you very much, Melly. You've been very generous tonight. Thank you very, very much. Um, here's a little Wikipedia thing on brain implants. It conveniently skips, again, uh, that whole period that we just discussed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s and begins in the 1970s. Uh, some of the gentlemen that we just discussed are nowhere to be found on here, interestingly enough. Um, it does talk about how DARPA has announced its interest in developing cyborg insects to transmit data from sensors implanted in the si in the, into the insect during pupil stage the insect's motion would be monitored from a micro electromechanical system and could conceivably survey an environment or detect explosions and gas similarly darpa is developing a neural implant to remotely control the movement of sharks the shark's unique senses would then be exploited to provide data feedback in relation to to enemy ship movement and underwater explosives so this is not outrageous guys this research that we're talking about tonight is prevalent and it's prevalent in many dimensions of our government. So here is a quick overview. I want to read this article to you and then we're going to get into, I got some videos. This is Elon Musk's original Neuralink presentation. We'll be getting right here and watching that. Um, this is a video on uh, how Neuralink got FDA approval and what's it all about and, and as well as these videos right here. So I want to watch some of that stuff. We'll be able to sit back, relax, check that stuff out. But before we do, as promised, I'm going to give you a bit of a historical overview of the history of brain implants from remote control bowls, obviously Dr. Jose Delgado, to bionic eyes. And so the article reads, it's a sweltering summer in the city of Cordoba, southern Spain. Spectators have gathered to watch not unfamiliar sight in the Iberian Peninsula, a man taunting an enraged bull with a, chrism a, a crimson red cape. But as the bull charges toward the man, horns poised to fear, pierce his flesh, something extraordinarily happens. The man pushes a button on the device he's holding in the left hand. And as if like magic, the bull suddenly loses interest, stops charging and wanders away. The spectators present on that day in 1963 bared witness to one of the first demonstrations of direct mind control. The bull was fitted with a brain implant, an electrode array embedded in a part of its brain called the uh, caudate nucleus, which when switched on by the man, Yale University neural engineer Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado caused the bull to instantly shed all its feelings of aggression. Delgado's demonstration was a key moment in the history of one of humanity's most controversial technological endeavors, meddling mind and machine with brain implants. And I really want to show you guys this video. So let me pull this up real quick. I'm sure I can find it. I'll put in uh, Dr. Jose Delgado Bowl. Let's see. Um, no, 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 no. I mean, I don't want somebody, here we go. I don't want somebody commenting on it. I just want to show you what it does. Here we go. Let me let me pull this up for you guys and so we can watch this real quick so you can kind of 
get what this article is actually talking about, what I discussed. Here we go. Is not new. Electronic mind control research is not new. A scientific milestone in this area came in the 1960s when Dr. Jose Delgado demonstrated remote control over a charging bull. By connecting a radio antenna to electrodes inserted into the bull's brain, Delgado proved that the animal's aggressive impulses could be thwarted by electronically manipulating the bull's muscle reflexes. Do you realize the fantastic possibilities if from the outside we could modify the inside? Could we give messages to the inside? But the beauty is that now we are not using electrodes. In recent years, Delgado has shown that the behavior of monkeys can be altered using low-power pulsating magnetic fields. But in these experiments, there were no antenna implants. Any function in the brain, emotions, intellect, personality, well, could be perhaps modified by this non-invasive technology. Delgado's research has so far been limited to animals. But in the Soviet Union, a radio frequency, or RF device, has been... It was not limited to animals. Jose Delgado himself contributed multiple experiments on people. Used for over 30 years to manipulate the moods of mental patients. Okay, so that's what this article is talking about. Now you guys got an idea of what this photo right here is from. So the discovery of bioelectricity. Humans have long been equated, acquainted with the electrical nature of living things. The electrical eel, actually a fish, not an eel, can produce a shock of 10 volts with its electric organ. And as first named by zoologist Carl Linnaeus in 1766, in the 1770s, a series of experiments demonstrated that the torpedo fish, a.k.a. electric ray, delivered its own 200-volt shock by electric means. It was the Italian physician Luigi Galvani, who, again, we saw right here in our, in our little PowerPoint presentation, who first provided evidence that all living things were, in a certain sense, electrical. On a winter's day in 1780, Galvani was dissecting a dead frog with a metal scalpel when the frog's leg suddenly jerked. Galvani realized that the scalpel had accumulated static electricity, which was able to animate the frog through some kind of internal electrical system. Galvani had discovered the basis of the human nervous system. Okay, first forays into neuro neural control. If the brain operated via electricity, that meant it should be possible to manipulate the movements of a living thing with electrical brain stimulation. German neuroscientists Edward Hitzig and Gustav Fritsch became the first researchers to achieve this in 1870 when they stimulated the brain of a dog. The movements produced were highly predictable, suggesting different parts of the cerebral cortex were responsible for different muscles. But what about human beings? Could our brains also be manipulated in this way? A few years later, American neurosurgeon Robert Bartholomew provided a resounding yes. One of Bartholomew's patients, a young woman named Mary Raff Raffertry, or Rafferty, um, had developed an ulceration on her head and eventually a gap in her skull caused by friction from a whalebone in a wig. The surgeon couldn't pass up this opportunity to gain an ideal test subject. With her consent, he stimulated her exposed brain with electrodes and saw that her arm was thrown out. The fingers extended and the leg was projected forward. Bartholomew jacked up the current, delivering a much stronger stimulation than before. This time, her countenance exhibited great distress and she began to cry. She lost consciousness and succeeded by coma. Mary awoke from the coma but died a few days later. It's not clear to what extent the electrical stimulation did or did not contribute to her death. Bartholomew's experiment had a sad and shocking nadir in the history of medical and scientific ethics. But nonetheless, the neurosurgeon provided us with the definitive proof that just like the frogs and dogs, human brains could also be manipulated by electrical stimulation. The groundwork for neural implants had been set. Now it gets into Dr. Jose Delgado, fearful monkeys and remote control bulls. Jose Manuel Rodriguez, Rodriguez Delgado is probably the most controversial figure in the history of brain implants, not just for the technologies that he built and demonstrated, but also for his views on how those technologies should be used. 
In the late 1940s, the lobotomy, an operation in which the frontal lobe of a psychiatric patient is removed or destroyed in order to pacify them, was in vogue on both sides of the Atlantic. A young Delgado wondered whether such damaging surgical interventions could be avoided by designing electrical implants that would achieve the same effect. Delgado designed, uh, designed compact implantable systems the size of a large coin, which he implanted in the brains of epilepsy and schizophrenia sufferers who had failed to respond to other kinds of treatment. He also created a chemotrode which could release drugs on command into a particular part of the brain. Aside from his famous bowl experiment, Delgado carried out many other demonstrations of how a brain implant could be used to alter mood. In one study, he showed how a female macaque could save herself from attack by an aggressive alpha male by pulling a lever that would activate electrodes stimulating his caudate nucleus in, other, in another study stimulating the brain of a calm, gentle woman sent her into a fit of rage where she smashed her guitar against the wall. Now that woman that smashed her guitar against the wall, that was another woman that he experimented on along with Leonard Kyle, as I mentioned earlier in the opening monologue. Now what's interesting is some of the research that was done in regards to uh, altering the pleasure senses is there is significant research at looking at how, um, so for example, there's a couple instances in which a woman who had these implants, they would begin to stimulate her pleasure center while she was interacting with the doctor, a doctor which she really wasn't familiar with that much, but just in a matter of hours, she was so fond of the doctor because he was stimulating her pleasure sense while they interacted that she talked about how sexually attracted she was and that she wanted to marry him. Well, they did the same research on an 11 year old boy and the 11 year old boy, again, him not realizing what exactly was happening, made a comment to the doctor that he wished he was a little girl because he felt such attraction to the doctor. This is what they're talking about, about the manipulation of mood. Also, Jose Delgado uh, is the first person to cure a homosexual, according to him. They found a homosexual man, put electrodes in his brain, and then began to sexually stimulate him in the presence of a female prostitute, of which then he, accordingly to the research by Delgado, became a heterosexual, signifying that homosexuality was a brain neurosis that could be cured by these electrodes. So when they're talking about altering mood, it's to a much more significant degree than just that, okay? Um, Delgado's research led to a public backlash with fears about the Orwellian implications of the brain stimulation technology. Delgado himself was a keen advocate of using the devices to control human behavior. Combined with the controversy surrounding lobotomy and electroshock therapy, the backlash was enough to seriously slow down the development of neural interfacing technologies. This is him and his wife. So we see an older Jose Delgado. We see one of his macaque monkeys with electrodes. And here is his wife, uh, Caroline, helping him. Making the deaf hear in the blind see. Among the controversy over remote controlled monkeys and bulls, it's easy to forget the huge positive medical achievements that have come from the field of neural interfaces. By far the most successful neuroprosthetic ever devised is the cochlear implant, a device which has allowed thousands of deaf people to hear. The cochlear is a spiral-shaped organ found inside the ear, which converts sound waves, mechanical signals, to neural impulses, electrical signals, which the brain can then interpret, allowing us to hear. In many deaf people, the tiny hairs in the cochlear that carry out this transduction have become damaged or no longer work. The first implantable system was a system to directly stimulate the cochlear nerve and bypass the damaged cochlea, thus effectively curing deafness, was created by American engineers William House and John Doyle in 1961. Today, over 200,000 people around the world have been given the gift of hearing through such a device. Implants to allow the blind to see have also been created. Although progress with these have been much slower than with the cochlear implant, as early as the 1950s, scientists discovered that electrical stimulation of the visual cortex, the part of the brain that interprets visual information, could elicit colorful visual hallucinations called uh, phosphenes. You can see phosphenes yourself if you rub your eyes for a couple of minutes. 
Now, one of the interesting things, and we cover this in part two over at the website, is Dr. Delgado had such a incredible mapping of the mind that he was able to take one of his macaque monkeys and he could dilate different eyes. He could uh, open up one eye like a, I mean, it's like a camera. One would be huge and the other one would be super, super tiny. And he could manipulate the dilation of eyes through, the, through electrical stimulation of his implants. The first implantable device designed to stimulate the retina, the light sensitive part of the eye, was tested in 2002. This device was called the Argus One and was created by American engineer Robert Greenberg. Although only allowing for the perception of simple shapes, this implant was the first example of an astounding medical achievement, something that would have once been relegated to the category of a miracle. Earlier this year, engineers at... Uh, Lausanne Federal Institute of Technology unveiled a retinal implant good enough to actually render a blind individual legally non-blind. They boast that the device could allow the user to live a relatively normal life. Developing technologies to restore sight and hearing the disabled individuals is undoubtedly one of the most astounding of humanity's achievements. And this is something that, again, when we look at uh, Elon Musk and Neuralink, that they believe that they'll be able to cure blindness and cure really any uh, ailment of the brain with their implants because they could just um, find, bypass. So any sort of detriment of your auditory or your visual capacity, they can just bypass that and begin to stimulate it electrically. And so this is something that Neuralink, as we'll see, uh, absolutely plans to do. Going deep. Almost everyone knows someone with Parkinson's disease. The debilitating motor disorder, which mainly affects the elderly, starts off as a slight tremor in the hands and eventually progresses to complete paralysis and death. Human beings have triumphed over many natural hurdles, tripling our lifespan over the last few centuries. But this increased lifespan leaves us with the ominous feeling that we all may one day suffer from such diseases as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Thankfully, here, the field of neural engineering also comes to the rescue. Most PD sufferers are tested with the drug L-DOPA, which is converted in the brain to dopamine, the key chemical required to affect motor coordination. However, for some sufferers, pharmaceutical treatment is not enough and a more radical technique is required, deep brain stimulation. Scientists working with monkey models of PD or Parkinson's disease in the early 1990s discovered the, that lesioning, i.e. physically destroying a part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus, could alleviate the monkey's systems, symptoms. And this is part of a process called psychosurgery. So psychosurgery is something that is quite controversial in the medical field. And what it does, again, uh, you know, the West has sort of put limits on it, but psychosurgery is about creating lesions in different parts of your brain in a sense, to deactivate it. So it's not a lobotomy. They're not removing or destroying your neofrontal cortex, but they are creating lesions in different parts of the brain. So like psychosurgery is a collaboration between psychiatrists and neuroscience, uh, neurosurgeons during the operation, which is carried out under general anesthetics and using stereotactic methods, a small piece of brain is destroyed or removed the common types of psychosurgery in current or recent use are anterior capsulotomy and so on. Lesions are made by radiation, thermocoagulation, freezing, or cutting. A third of a patient's show significant improvement in their symptoms after operation. Advances in surgical techniques have greatly uh, reduced the incidence of death and serious damage from psychosurgery. The remaining risks include seizures, incontinence, uh, decreased drive and initiative, weight gain, and cognitive and affective problems. So this is a very controversial uh, procedure, but that's exactly what they're referring to here in regards to creating lesions in the brain. Today, thousands of people have been fitted with deep brain stimulation systems to treat not just Parkinson's disease, but also epilepsy, chronic pain, depression, and obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder. So-called closed loop systems have been developed that can detect a patient when a patient requires help and then deliver the correct stimulation automatically. The introduction of a closed loop system has resulted in some interesting findings about human psychology, our sense of self, while seeming unquestionably real, 
is more likely to be kind of an illusion constructed by our brain. Users of closed loop brain stimulation devices sometimes report that system dissolve their sense of self and agency. This can be deeply troubling for many people and could pose a significant barrier to the widespread adoption of neural implants. Yeah, I think so. Moving forward. Deep brain stimulation has been a great success for people with movement coordination issues, but what about paralyzed individuals who cannot move at all? For them, a much more impressive technology is required. Bionic limbs integrated with neural interface devices. In 2000, Brazilian neural engineer Miguel Nicolás stunned the world when he showed them a monkey that could control a robotic arm with its mind. Eight years later, he demonstrated a system where the monkey could use a brain implant control an entire robot walking on a treadmill. Prosthetic limbs have become increasingly oppressive over the last decade. What's holding back such prosthetics, however, is the interface with the nervous system. Most importantly, prosthetic systems currently lack something very important that most of us don't even realize we have, proprioception. Proprioception is an internal sense that allows us to orient our limbs with respect to each other. Without it, we would have to stare at our limbs at all times in order to move them correctly. For users of neurally interfaced prosthetic limbs today, that is their reality, a painstakingly slow and awkward process in which every movement must be taken very carefully to avoid slip-ups. Many engineers are attempting to develop feedback loop systems that will stimulate the nerves in the leg to create an artificial proprioceptive sense. So far, this approach has proved highly promising, although we're still a long way from every paralyzed person in the world being able to get fitted with such a system. The light, fantastic. Since the earliest experiments by Bartholomew and Delgado, brain implants have manipulated neural activity through electrical stimulation. This made a lot of sense given the electrical nature of the nervous system. However, a new technology called optogenetics could challenge the dominance of this electrical paradigm. Invented by American engineer Ed Boyden, op optogenetics uses light instead of electricity to stimulate and inhibit neurons. Genetic engineering technologies allow light-sensitive channels to be made inside the neurons of a particular type. These channels can then be activated by tiny lights implanted in the brain. While electrical stimulation can be a bit of a sledgehammer-like tool, stimulating large numbers of neurons of various types, optogenetics allows brain stimulation to be much more precise. An optogenetic implant could use different colors of light combined with different types of light-sensitive channel to both stimulate and inhibit different kinds of neuron at the same time. Will we become cyborgs? Although today the brain implants are used for medical purposes to restore loss of absent function to patients, many have speculated about a future in which healthy humans could become cyborgs that use brain implants and other neural prosthetics to augment their mental and physical faculties. British engineer Kevin Warwick made waves in 2002 when he had an electrode array implanted in his arm, which allowed him to control a robotic hand. Today, there is a global community of individuals who call themselves grinders or biohackers who have augmented themselves with implanted devices such as magnets, RFID chips. In 2017, artist Neil Harbison had a device fitted that allows him to hear color through vibrations in his skull. The rare examples, notwithstanding, neural implants have so far failed to make a breakthrough as mainstream technologies for healthy individuals. This is partly down to the large risk involved. Implantation of a device in the brain can lead to infection or stroke, something that most healthy individuals are not willing to risk to obtain minimal augmentation. Current devices also tend to be wireless, which restricts everyday functionality. However, Large-scale interest in commercializing brain implants has surfaced in recent years. Most notably, entrepreneur Elon Musk of Tesla and SpaceX fame has started a company called Neuralink that aims to create flexible brain implants. Musk believes that human beings will be outpaced and possibly dominated by artificial intelligence if we don't augment ourselves as soon as possible. Whether or not it is our destiny to become cyborgs, it is clear that with both commercial and medical interests on the rise, brain implants are a technology that will become increasingly prevalent over the next few decades. They could change our lives and perhaps even change what it means 
to be human. And so with that, we're now going to move to some videos about Elon Musk. This is an article that I I just wanted to highlight. We're not going to read it or anything. It's about how Elon Musk wants to merge humans with AI. How many brains will be damaged along the way? And it highlights that uh, according to Elon Musk's own words, the point of Neuralink is to achieve symbiosis with artificial intelligence, which we're getting ready to watch him say. I went and found the video. And so uh, why Elon Musk wants to merge human brains with AI. And I come down here, although Musk is not alone in warning about the civilizational risk posed by AI systems, where he differs from others is his plan of warding off the risk. The plan is basically if you can't beat them, join them. And that's exactly what he's doing. So this article goes on. I can share this stuff with you guys. If you guys want to read these articles, let me share with them, share them with you right now, real quick. Um, all right. Here's the first one. Here's the one that I just read, the one on the history of brain implants. Here's the Vox article. I'm not a big fan of Vox, but it is a, a good article looking at critically at Elon Musk and Neuralink. Um, just for everybody who's here again, I want to say, if you'd like to support this stream, please do so. I'm the point of today's stream is to raise funds so I can purchase this book right here. I need to get a physical copy of physical control of the mind toward a psycho civilized society. Um, I would greatly appreciate that. It's about $80. If you would like to support, please send in a super chat using the stream labs or the dono chat link. Or if you prefer to use YouTube, YouTube would work as well. I would greatly appreciate all support um, for that in my the research. Okay, so here is a video of Neuralink in which they use a monkey. So this monkey has already mm -hmm. been fitted with a Neuralink device, and he's able to control the cursor on this computer. Oh, he's able to control the cursor and play Pong here uh, with a computer only through his brain. He's been trained to play this. And so this is a macaque monkey, again, demonstrating playing Pong with his own mind. Okay, so I show you that because, yes, there are cl clearly medical breakthroughs that are happening with all this technology. But as I said, the stated purpose of it is not so much the medical, but to provide a full symbiosis with um, the AI system. So we're going to watch that video right here. But again, the second half of this stream is over at my website. Become a website member if you'd like to access that. I'm just going to run through here and show you a few of the movers and shakers that are important to that part two. We're not going to read much of it, but um, Walter Jackson Freeman was an American physician who specialized in lobotomy. It's speculated that he lobotomized over 50,000 Americans, 50,000 Americans. He either removed or destroyed their neofrontal cortex. This is uh, Jose Delgado, who we've already mentioned, um, Peter Bregan. Peter Bregan's actually a really good individual. Again, he's in the part two video. He actually stopped many of these experiments and the funding to some of these projects uh, by highlighting that it was unethical. And so he's also wrote a book. Uh, so he was an American psych psychiatrist and critic of shock treatment and psychiatric medi medication. And he wrote a pretty based book on the COOF. In his books, he ad advocates replacing psychiatry use of drugs and electroconvulsive uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy with psychotherapy, education, empathy, love, and the broader human services. But um, 
kind of a, a, a an interesting individual. He's been critical of conventional psychiatry. He is against uh, the use uh, ADH definition. He's redefined it as dad, talking about how with his research, he's found that many people that have attention uh, deficit disorder, hyper deficit disorder, often have a very poor relationship with their biological father and that their biological father's often uh, at, at work, doesn't pay attention to them one way or another. And so he believes that it's more relational than uh, biological. He's against the use of SSRI antidepressants. He's against the electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and he's been labeled as a conspiracy theorist because his latest book right here, uh, The Coof and the Global Predators, we are the prey of which he outlines that there has been a global agenda by various elites for over a decade to establish a sort of medical tyranny of which he speculates that 2020 was the beginning of ushering that in. So I'm sure some of us probably agree with that. So Peter Bregan is actually a pretty interesting guy. Um, uh, Norbert Weiner, remember the gentleman that auto uh, cr created the autocorrelator? He was a mathematician. Um interested in cybernetics. This is another Warren McCullough. This is all in part two. Lawrence Kuby, um, Horace McGowan, uh, Lewis West, and Mary Brazier. I would read more about it, but I really want to get over here to uh, Elon Musk. So here we go. Here is Elon Musk's, um, his Opening presentation of the Neuralink. So check this out. Um, remind you, he is explicit that the purpose of Neuralink, yes, it's to help people. Yes, it's to help paraplegics. But number one, first and foremost, it's actually about creating a symbiosis between man and AI. ...of nearly 100 billion cells called neurons. Neurons come in many complex shapes, but generally they have a dendritic arbor... So that uh, that video was uh, not Shutterstock. That was actually uh, Neuralink. <laughs> so uh, that, that that's actual video from the company. So if you want to get a sense for what it's like to work at Neuralink, that video is indicative of the atmosphere of, of Neuralink. Uh, it's an incredibly talented team, and you're going to hear a lot from from them tonight. Um, so we're going to actually go quite into depth on what we're doing, why we're doing, how we're doing it, um, and uh, I just incredibly impressed with uh, the, the caliber of, uh, of of talent at Neuralink. And uh, the, in fact, the, the main reason for doing this presentation is recruiting. Um, and this will be a slow process where we, we will gradually increase the um, issues that we solve until ultimately we, we can do a full uh, brain machine interface. Yeah, this is going to sound pretty weird, but um, achieve a sort of symbiosis with artificial intelligence. But I think with um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. Um, and we can effectively have the option of merging with AI. I think this is extremely important. Most of nearly 100 billion cells called neurons. Neurons come in many complex shapes, but generally they have a dendritic arbor, a cell body called a soma, and an axon. The neurons of your brain connect to form a large network through axon dendrite junctions called synapses. At these connection points, neurons communicate with each other using chemical signals called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are released from the end of an axon in response to an electrical spike called an action potential. When a cell receives enough of the right kind of neurotransmitter input, a chain reaction is triggered that causes an action potential to fire and the neuron to in turn relay messages to its own downstream synapses. Action potentials produce an electric field that spreads from the neuron and can be detected by placing electrodes nearby, allowing recording of the information represented by a neuron. Our goal is to record from and stimulate um, spikes in neurons and, and do so in a way that is uh, orders of magnitude um, more than anything that's been done to date and uh, safe and um, good enough that you can, it's, it's not 
like a major operation. It's it's sort of equivalent to to sort of a LASIK type of thing. So this is in contrast to um, the the best FDA approved system, which is like a, a Parkinson's deep brain stimulation a thing, which would have on the order of, of ten electrodes. So um, the system, even in version one that we're uh, going to unveil today, is capable of of a thousand times more uh, electrodes than the, uh, the the best system out there. And so, Dr. Jose Delgado, when he was performing his research, like on Leonard Kyle, he put in eighty electrodes over again. As he's highlighting, Neuralink is a thousand times more in regards to the ability to put electrodes into the brain. So imagine how many more uh, connections, how much more feedback loop can be attained by his Neuralink, Neuralink uh, science. And they're all read and write. So this is this is really quite, I think, I mean, for something to be a thousand times more than what is public approved is quite a big difference. Um, so th there's there's very tiny threads that are about um, about a tenth, roughly, of the cross-sectional area of a, of a human hair. So they're extremely tiny threads. In fact, the, the threads that uh, we, we have, like I said, even in version one, are, are about the same size as a neuron. So if you're gonna go stick something in your brain, you, you, you want it to not be giant, uh, you want it to be tiny, um, and to be approximately on par with the things that are already there, the, the neurons. You, you really need this to be done with a robot, because it's very tiny and it needs to be very precise. So you don't, and you don't want to pierce a blood vessel. So when you, so each thread that the robot looks, looks sort of basically through a microscope and puts a, put, inserts each electrode specifically, um, bypassing uh, any vasculature, uh, you know, any, any kind of like blood vessel um, uh, and, and making sure it's, it's like it can be inserted without causing trauma. Uh, or minimal trauma. So just to give you a sense of scale, this is how tiny the threads are. Uh, that is not even a big finger, that is a small finger. Um, so the, there's a, these threads are just like, like I said, way, way smaller than a hair, um, and there's a thousand of them. And this is what, what the robot looks like. Um, it's, it's sort of a, quite, quite a complex device, but it, uh, it it, it all comes down to a very tiny, tiny point. So just, just, just we want to just like you see, you see the robot, the robot on the left, and um, and then the um, what looks like the needles for insertion next to a penny. But in fact, the, the the actual needle that gets inserted is way, way tinier. It's that little tiny thing at the where the arrow is pointing. That's actually the size of the the needle. It's about 24 microns in diameter. Uh, it, it's so small you can't really even see it with in the picture with the penny. You can get a sense for the uh, robot doing the electrode insertion. Um, that, that's a very zoomed in view. So they're all very, very tiny and the robot is very selectively applying them very, de very delicately um, and, uh, and then this is what the chip looks like. So, action potentials. Um, Those are the so EEGs that it reads. represents one electrode. So there would be up to ten thousand of of these uh, of, of these lines. Um, the 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 operation on a per chip basis uh, it, it involves just a a, a two mil a two millimeter. Uh, incision, which is dilated to eight millimeters, um, and then the, the the chip is placed placed through that, and then it, re uh, it goes back to being two millimeters, and you can basically go shut. Uh, you don't even need a stitch, and and then the the interface to the um, to the to the chip is is wireless, so you have no wires poking out of your head. Very very important. Um, so you uh, it, it's it basically Bluetooth to your phone. Because we'll have to watch the App Store updates for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure we don't have a driver issue, and we, we hope to uh, have this uh, aspirationally in in a human patient um, before the end of next year. So this is not not far. I'm Max Hodak. I'm the president of, of Neuralink. 
So I've wanted to build a, a neural interface has really been like a, a central goal of my life for basically as long as I can remember. This is, it, I think like we talk about AI being potentially the last invention that we have. I think that a high bandwidth BMI might be like really the first invention in many ways of like the next chapter of, of us. It's just really like as Elon alluded to earlier, everything about your experience, your thoughts, your memories, it's all in your brain and represented in the firing statistics of action potentials. Um, we knew as, as Elon mentioned that whatever we built, we wanted it to be completely wireless. It had to be something that would last for a long period of time, not something that you'd have to take out at two, three, or, or four years in. Um, this is a photo of some of the prototypes that we've gone through um, over that over that time. So we started on the uh, far left. That's an entirely passive board that has 64 electrodes on it and connects to connectors that go to big external amplifiers. And then we added integrated electronics with our first custom chip. That's also 64, 64 channels. Fully assembled, this is missing an outer mold. Um, it's into an eight millimeter diameter, uh, four millimeter tall cylinder. Exploding it, uh, blowing, like opening it up a little bit, you can see there's there's the thin film, which has the threads that Elon talked about, which is the wisp going off to the side. There's a hermetic substrate, and then that gets welded later to a, a package that goes over top, and that's mated to our custom electronics. And you really can't manipulate these with your hand. That, that part at the top is uh, just a backing material that's surgical packaging. They're, they're peeled off. Uh, the threads are peeled off that one at a time by the robot to place into the brain. And the first uh, impetus for this is just you have to place these threads. You can't manipulate these threads. You need a robot. And then that turned out to, that grew into understanding where the blood vessels are and imaging into the tissue and the surface of the brain moves because you're breathing and you have a heartbeat. And there's lots of complexity of dealing with this incredibly high entropy substrate. And so the N1 implant, um, we can place, as Elon mentioned, many of these, possibly up to 10. In one hemisphere, for our first patients, we're looking at four, four sensors, three in motor areas and one in a somatosensory area. And that connects wirelessly through the skin to a wearable device that we call the Link, which contains a Bluetooth radio and a battery. It'll be controlled through an iPhone app. You won't have to go to a doctor's office and have them have an exotic programmer to, uh, to configure it. And so the, for the first product, um, we're, we're really focusing on three distinct types of control. Um, the first is giving patients the ability to control their mobile device, as we heard from over and over again from patient groups that if you have to have a caretaker around to press buttons for you, what's the point? You might as well have them do the thing. You have to get self-sufficient using uh, using the devices on your own. Um, but we are working as hard as we can towards our first in-human clinical study next year. Uh, we developed this. Okay. Yeah, the the second the rest of it's not as interesting. So <clears throat> we'll move on to the next videos. I got some good ones. We may skip this one. This one may get copyrighted because it comes from a, an account that has 1.2 million followers, interesting engineering. But these two are very interesting in regards to Elon Musk Neuralink may be the solution to the AI control problem part one. So we're, we're going to watch that in just a moment. I want to give a special thank you to uh, we had two uh, donators. We got $10 over on the dono chat from Timoth uh, Timothy Doyer throws in $10 says, hope this helps get that book. God bless. Well, thank you so much, Timothy. I am almost there. I think we're at, um, I think we're at like 50, $55. So uh, the goal is $80 guys. If you can help me out, I'd greatly appreciate it. If you can help me, if you appreciate my research, you appreciate these videos, please help me out. And we had another $5 come in from Amelia. A Strauss donates $5. Thank you so much, Amelia. Really appreciate that. Thank you all so much who have donated tonight. Thank you all for all your support over the years. I've now been doing this YouTube channel for four years, trying to provide high uh, academic scholastic information for you guys. And I truly do love you guys and appreciate all the support. So thank you very, very much. All right. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, thank you, Amelia A. Strauss. Thank you very much, Timothy Doyer, for your for your guys' support. Um, help me get to my goal just to get this stupid book. Uh, it's not stupid. I think it's going to be a fantastic stream once I'm able to get it. But I really want to get Dr. Delgado's book. Uh, there's not that many out there. So it's not like it's gone through a lot of reprints. So anyways, let's move on to the last couple videos here. Um, this one is a video on Elon Musk Neuralink, maybe the solution to AI control. If this gets copyrighted, then we'll we'll shut it down, but I hope we'll be able to play this. So uh, check this one out.
There's somebody who had a good suggestion for what the um, optimization of the AI should be. What's its utility function? You have to be careful about this because you say maximize happiness and the AI concludes that happiness is a function of dopamine and serotonin. The AI should try to maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. I like that definition. In artificial intelligence, the AI control problem is the issue of how to build a super intelligent agent that will aid its creators and avoid inadvertently building a super intelligence that could render humanity extinct. Elon Musk, among many other public thinkers, has publicly raised concerns about the risks involved in the creation of a digital superintelligence. Musk has warned that AI could spell the end of the human race. We should therefore proceed very carefully in the development of AI systems. One of the solutions for the AI control problem proposed by Elon Musk is the integration of AI with the human brain through a brain-computer interface sometimes called a neural control interface and a brain machine interface or BMI. In 2016, Elon Musk founded the American neurotechnology company called Neuralink, which is a company focused on the development of implantable brain machine interfaces. This technology involves a module placed outside the head that wirelessly receives information from thin, flexible electrode threads embedded in the brain. The threads will be embedded by a robotic apparatus with the intention to avoid damaging blood vessels. In terms of things that I think are important to bear in mind, this I think has a very good purpose, which is to cure important diseases and ultimately to help secure humanity's future as a civilization relative to AI. The threads are very tiny, and there's a lot of them, and they're very carefully placed. And the operation on a per-chip basis involves just a, a two millimeter uh, incision, which is dilated to eight millimeters, and then the, the, the chip is placed through that, and then it goes back to being two millimeters, and you can basically glue it shut. Uh, you don't even need a stitch. The system is expected to include as many as 3,072 electrodes per array distributed across 96 threads, each four to six micrometers in width. Musk described it as, it's like a Fitbit for your skull with tiny wires. He has claimed that in principle, Neuralink's BMI will be able to fix anything that's wrong with the brain. Musk also hopes future iteration of the Neuralink device will offer symbiosis with artificial intelligence. That way we could merge with machines and hopefully avoid a possible digital apocalypse. So the interface to the chip is, is wireless. So you have no wires poking out of your head. Very, very important. It's basically Bluetooth to your phone. This is something that is, is going to be not stressful to, to put in. It should work well, hopefully, and it's wireless. So this, I think, has tremendous potential. And we, we hope to have this aspirationally in a human patient before the end of next year. So this is not, not far. The technology is quickly moving forward. Human beings would be able to extend their cognition and their experience beyond the limits of brain space. Neuralink's BMI technology could also open up new possibilities of creativity, enhancing the brain. Perhaps in time, imagination will be joined with memory and, as a result, people will be able to experience a wider spectrum of thoughts and ideas. It could open up new possibilities of creativity, enhancing the brain. Neuralink's BMI technology might be able to overcome the biological limits of our minds and could even expand our intelligence. The symbiosis between AI and humans may greatly benefit our species. It may also help humanity to expand out into space. In spite of these possibilities, Musk has mentioned that there are also trivial reasons that drive his concern about the future of AI. Musk has described the potential advent of digital superintelligence as the scariest problem to me and more pressing than climate change. Musk said that he sees the creation of digital superintelligences as a great risk to the existence of humanity 
but he also thinks that we must nevertheless pursue its development. This may seem like a contradiction to many people, but the development of AI technology is unique to our species history because it can either prove to be the best or the worst invention ever. Either way, it may very well be the last invention of humankind, for better or for worse. Elon Musk and many others fear it could be the latter. The creation of digital superintelligence may help us achieve the next level of human evolution. Reducing existential risk from superintelligent AI may be extremely difficult, but the integration of humans with AI may improve the probability of a good outcome. One possible strategy is to continue to increase the intelligence and values of AI systems, while simultaneously improving our understanding of human cognition. At some point, the rate of human intelligence and the rate of AI intelligence could converge. Although this may seem a desirable result, there is a significant chance that such a superintelligence would be malevolent. Current trends in AI research seem to be leading towards this endgame. Another possible outcome could be that humanity and superintelligence will converge, resulting in an intelligence explosion in which the value of brute force intelligence approaches infinity. A possible apocalyptic scenario is one in which superintelligences create a computational grid encompassing the entire observable universe. Superintelligences could then proceed to exploit this grid in order to gain energy through the annihilation of matter. This would lead to the end of the world as the energy attained by the superintelligence would exceed the energy output of the universe, causing the system to collapse to a point. It is speculated that certain widespread brain enhancements could give an advantage to humanity, especially if combined with enhancements to the AI. It has been proposed that a human might be able to compete with a superintelligence on the basis of moral values. If a superhuman intelligence is programmed to follow human values and ethics, it may still decide to exterminate or subjugate its creators when it is created in a different environment to the conditions created by the scientists. But we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by creating a high bandwidth interface between AI and human brain. We're already a cyborg in the sense that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. We've got to build an interface. Like we didn't evolve to have a communications jack. So there's got to be essentially vast numbers of tiny electrodes that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. This would be a digital extension of you that is an AI, the AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. So you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you. And the high bandwidth connection is what achieves a tight symbiosis. Stephen Hawking suggested that artificial intelligence could be the worst invention of the century and that an AI will eventually look back on humanity and either decide we are irrelevant or harmful and so we need to be destroyed or they will simply follow their programming and decide to maximize the amount of good in the world. The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. On the other hand, futurist Ray Kurzweil has stated that an AI would be able to understand human desires and motivations, and that he is not worried about the emergence of a machine superintelligence. I think you go through three phases of considering a strong AI or any of these dramatic new information technologies as they get to be very powerful. One is delight at the opportunity to overcome age-old afflictions and problems of humanity, then alarm that, whoa, these things could be dangerous. We've always had promise in parallel with technology. Overall, technology has provided a far better quality of life than humanity has ever had, and that's a continuing process. Kurzweil argues that the human economies and recent human history shows that humans and machines can work well with each other. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments section.
Okay, now we're going to go over to part two of this little video series. I uh, want to give a special thank you to Amelia A. Strauss. She just donated another $10. Thank you so much, Amelia, for your support tonight. God bless you, sister. And a major shout out to a continual supporter as well. BMX 1966 throws in $5. Thank you so much, brother, for that. I really do appreciate that super chat. And I think we're almost there for the goal to get my book. So thank you guys very much. If you want to show some love while we wrap up this stream, please send in a super chat using the Streamlabs or the Dono chat link. Or if you prefer to use YouTube, use YouTube. That works just as well. Okay, here is the final video in our stream today. This part one. Again, part two of this stream is already up at the website, so make sure to check that out if that's something you're interested in. It's a great way to support my work, and I'd be greatly, greatly appreciative if you sign it up. It's $5 a month, a cup of coffee. You support my work, and you get access to great exclusive video content. Look, you can see them here as slaves to logic. And this man on the hill comes to free them. Do you know who he is? So I want to emphasize the, the purpose of Neuralink. Like, uh, what do we, what's our goal? Our goal is to solve important spine and brain problems with a seamlessly implanted device. So you want to have a device that you can basically put in your head and feel and look totally normal, but it solves some important problem in your brain or spine. And the reality is that almost everyone over time will develop brain and spine problems. These range from minor to very severe, but if you live long enough, everyone's gonna basically have some kind of neurological disorder from memory loss to brain damage. But the thing that's important to appreciate is that an implantable device can actually solve these problems. I think a lot of people don't quite realize that, but all of your senses, your sight, hearing, feeling, pain, these are all electrical signals sent by neurons to your brain. And if you can correct these signals, you can solve everything from memory loss, blindness, paralysis, depression, insomnia, extreme pain, seizures, anxiety, addiction, strokes, brain damage. But these can all be solved with an implantable neural link. In the short term, Neuralink's BMI may be used to fix neurological problems and disorders. As Elon Musk has pointed out, over time, virtually everyone who gets old will suffer at least one, if not multiple, common neurological issues, such as memory loss, hearing loss, seizures, strokes, and brain damage, etc. With the development of Neuralink's device, these problems may be a thing of the past. Better yet, the integration of Neuralink's device with the human brain may advertently solve the artificial intelligence alignment problem by achieving a symbiotic relationship between humans and machines. This is because there are many cases where an AI and a biological intelligence could benefit from each other's actions. The AI receiving data from the human brain and the human brain receiving data from the AI. The benefit of this relationship would greatly outweigh the costs to both humans and AI systems. However, it is also very likely that AI systems and biological intelligences will at some point be in conflict. I think the, the first bit of advice would be to really pay close attention to the development of artificial intelligence. We need to just be very careful in how we adopt artificial intelligence and to make sure that researchers don't get carried away. Because sometimes what happens is a scientist can get so engrossed in their work, they don't necessarily realize the ramifications of what they're doing. So I think it's important for public safety that we you know, governments keep a close eye on artificial intelligence and make sure that it does not represent a danger to the public. Elon Musk has commented on the dangers of AI, saying it is the greatest risk we face as a civilization. However, in order to prove that Neuralink can solve this problem, two things will need to become clear. How does Neuralink achieve symbiosis with the human brain? And what are the side effects and potential drawbacks of this symbiosis? One possible downside would be that humans would lose their sense of individuality if we all interconnect our thoughts and ideas into the cloud. However, if we can continue to retain our individuality and use Neuralink in a productive way, the benefits far outweigh the potential risks. 
Worth mentioning is Neuralink's recent development of a device which connects people's brainwaves to computers to allow them to control machinery with their thoughts alone. The device is able to read from and write to neural synapses in a person's brain using very fine needle-like electrodes that penetrate a person's cranium. This technology, already in use on animals, requires no evasive surgery. Advanced versions of such devices inserted into the brains of quadriplegics and those suffering from brain trauma and other ailments that prevent them from moving their physical body could allow them to restore, if not enhance, the physical capabilities of the human body. We've simplified this to simply something that is about the size of a large coin and it goes in your skull, replaces a piece of skull and the wires then connect within a few centimeters or about an inch away from the device. And this is sort of what it looks like. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. The current prototype version 0.9 has about a thousand channels and it's a 23 millimeters by eight millimeters. In terms of getting a link, you need to have the device. You need to have a great robot that puts in the, the electrodes and uh, does the surgery. So you want the surgery to be as automated as possible. And the only way you can achieve the level of precision that's needed is with an advanced robot. The human race is advancing towards a great merging with the technology it has created. And as our technology grows, we will have to confront the questions that arise from our merging with it, not just of how to create it, but of how to control it and what heights we might achieve through this process. For the first time, there is a real possibility of extending our individual mental capabilities in a manner that goes beyond physical and biological constraints. The goal of Neuralink is to help achieve this vision, to come up with a neural base that's doing something beyond what we are doing right now in a major way. One of the main long-term goals of Neuralink is to help humans keep with the upcoming rapid technological advancements. By significantly extending the natural capabilities of the human brain, we will possibly create a global neural network of minds. This will allow us to either create or enhance a collective consciousness, an interconnected group of minds working together to solve the problems of humanity in the face of rapid technological advancements. Thus far, it seems emerging solution for the AI control problem is the best option for humanity to make it into the next century. An additional argument for the merging option is that the control problem might take a long time to satisfactorily solve and some preliminary work needs to be started as soon as possible, but also because of the possibility of a sudden intelligence explosion from subhuman to superhuman AI, in which case there might not be any substantial or unambiguous warning before a superintelligence arrives. In addition, it is possible that insights gained from the control problem could in the future end up suggesting that some systems for artificial general intelligence are more predictable and amenable to control than other systems, which in turn could helpfully nudge early AGI research towards the direction of the more controllable AI. Proposed approaches to the control problem include the creation of friendly AI. As Nick Bostrom states, the best strategy to assure ourselves that an AI remains friendly may be to endow it with interests similar to ours. If this strategy is successful, it will have the additional benefits of directing the first superintelligent system towards objectives that humans value. In other words, the control problem may be easier to solve if the superintelligent system is designed so that it wants what humans want, which is also known as the value alignment problem. The thing that's going to be tricky here is that it's going to be very tempting to use AI as a weapon the on-ramp to serious AI. The danger is going to be more humans using it against each other, I think, most likely. From a long-term existential standpoint, that's like the purpose of Neuralink, is to create a high bandwidth interface to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. I think best case scenario, we effectively merge with AI, where AI serves as a tertiary cognition layer, where we've got the limbic system, primitive brain essentially, we've got the cortex. If we do have a third layer, which is the AI extension of yourself, that is also symbiotic, and there's enough bandwidth between the cortex and the AI extension of yourself, such that the AI doesn't de facto separate. 
that could be a good outcome. That could be quite a positive outcome for the future. An AI system that has already surpassed a human level of intelligence might well deliberately hide the moment at which it becomes super intelligent in order to try to avoid any attempts to shut it down. However, once an AI has fully matched and then surpassed human intelligence, it will be difficult for it to hide it for long, especially if it is openly interacting with humans. And while it is possible that humanity will never know what causes an AI system to suddenly become super intelligent, it is possible that with foresight and an appropriate level of caution, this occurrence could be predicted and even controlled. Thanks for watching. Did you like? All right, guys. This is the conclusion of part one on my stream regarding the history of brain implants and the remote control of the body. If you'd like to check out part two, please go to my website and become a website member. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And we reached our goal with the final super chat. I got to give a very special thank you to Gary throws in $25. We have reached our goal for this evening. Thank you so much, Gary. God bless you, brother, for all your support. Truly appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for the support tonight. I can't tell you how appreciative I am over just the course of this channel, the work, creating these streams. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I truly appreciate all your guys' support. I love you guys. I really appreciate it. And I got to give a special thank you to Timothy Doyer, Gary, Amelia A. Strauss, BMX1966, Dr. Crispy Rothschild, Maximus, and Melly. Beyond Seraphim and Anglo Christian. So thank you all so much for your support tonight. I truly do appreciate it. And I will be back Sunday with a stream on why men love the Orthodox Church. We'll be talking a little bit about masculinity in Christ and why so many men in the West are becoming Orthodox and flocking to the Eastern Orthodox Church. I will see you then. So thank you all so much for all the support. As always, until next time, God bless.